Uh, so now we're joined by John Persak, who's running for City Council position eight. So go ahead with a two-minute introduction. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is John Persak, and I'm running for City, <coughs> city, of, city of Seattle City Council uh, position number eight. And uh, I'm running for two reasons. Um, I feel that there's a disconnect uh, with our current City Council and my partner for major issues and others uh, in our city, uh, affordability, development, police reform, and transportation. Uh, the second reason I'm running is because I feel that, you know, as a person who's lived in Seattle for quite a while, been here since 1989, um, I have a pretty general holistic view of what is happening in the city, um, and that my opponent, Burgess, um, is not I've lived up to the standards of our change in progressive values. Uh, I feel that our city over time has moved to making more demands on our city council in terms of you know, social equity and uh, labor standards and so forth. But I feel that I have a distinction from him because of, you know, I am labor, we're working on a short of uh, union member for a long time. Great, thank you. So now we have four prepared questions, and they're actually in front of you if you want to turn over the sheet of paper and read along with us. <laughs> and uh, these are two-minute answers. Um, and I think we want to stop. Uh, Elizabeth, you want to start with number one? Seattle is experiencing a housing affordability crisis. Several policy responses have been suggested, including linkage fees, incentive zoning, subsidized housing, and rent control, among others. What is your approach to keeping Seattle affordable? Um, I think all of those issues are valid. Um, I think there does need to be a robust discussion about rent control, even though our city currently does not have much control over that. Um, I think linkage fees and or fees <coughs> are appropriate uh, for new development in our neighborhoods. I think affordability and housing is one side of the affordability coin. The other side, of course, is that we need to make sure that people in Seattle um, are also making a living wage. And what I'm seeing is uh, Seattle has embarked on a, pro a policy of making it hard for small businesses and uh, larger employers to maintain the, the middle income uh, job base in our city. So what we're winding up with is a bedroom community for high wage jobs on the east side and a lot of service jobs that are you know, 12, 13, 14, eventually $15 an hour, and not a lot in the middle. And what that contributes to is um, uh, an income disparity, a uh, wealth disparity. And uh, when you have that, you have increased uh, rents, you have increased uh, property costs, you have increased cost of living. So we have to look at the jobs issue as well as um, you know, rents and housing affordability and so forth. Liz, number two. Uh, sure. Last year, voters approved a levy to fund the Universal Preschool Pilot Program. After the pilot concludes, how would you fund the full implementation of the program? And what policy changes would you make to assure this plan addresses educational disparities in our city? I'm glad that somebody is finally bringing up this issue in every forum I've read and it hasn't really been talked about. Um, I think of a key thing with the funding is to make sure that you know there are things in our budget that we can shift over, like things that you know, you know, the families and education money and so forth, making sure that that's fully funded uh, through uh, whatever funding mechanisms we may have, whether it's a levy or other funding mechanisms. Um, you know, early education is obviously very important. Um, I do have some concerns about it. I have some concerns that uh, the the referendum that was passed by the general public was put together in a hasty manner without input from a lot of stakeholders. And I think there needs to be a second look at it to make sure that it's ultimately successful. I think it puts uh, a lot of stress on the schools in terms of uh, uh, capital improvements. Um, there's possibilities that it might be competing with existing programs that are providing the same services, and there's a whole list of other things. We need to make sure that you know it's successful. Um, and I'm not sure that we're going to get there is if, if it's just kind of a go along in a long sort of process for implementation. Great. And then number three, Mary. Uh, Bertha is still stuck. What, <coughs> what, <coughs> what options does the city of Seattle have with respect to potential cost overruns the 
waterfront to transit in an unsafe viaduct? Mm -hmm. Well, it is a state project, and so that limits the city's ability to uh, make certain decisions about it. But um, we do need to make sure that people are protected from any potential hostile runs, particularly if um, the deep war tunnel machine is fixed and it breaks down underneath the city again. Um, we can expect that the state will probably try to finish the project no matter what, because there's a lot, a lot of you know, political credibility as well as um, you know, economic credibility riding on the state's ability to finish the project. And the question in my mind is, at what cost will the state do that? And it's up to our city government to make sure that uh, taxpayers in Seattle are protected and that we uh, derive um, the best uh, possible benefit from it. Now, if the project, for whatever reason, is not finished, um, you know, we, the unfortunate thing is we don't have a plan B, and I think plan B needs to happen now. Um, it's been said that we don't need a plan B, and um, I completely disagree with that assessment, and I don't really understand why our city council and our city government isn't putting together a plan B, because, you know, some, you know, sometimes things happen, and, you know, when it really comes down to it, if we have an unsafe viaduct, and also we have a tunnel that can't be completed um, at all, or at least foreseeable future, then you know, there has to be something put together, and we have to demand that the state get involved and help us do that, because it's a state highway, and demand that other state do as well. Great. Uh, Renee, number four. Seattle is the fastest growing big city in the country. Should we encourage or discourage this growth, and what policy changes are necessary to accommodate growth? Mm -hmm. I don't think there's a whole lot that we can do to keep people from moving here. If there's uh, work available, if there's uh, good employment available, if there's quality of life available that people want, they're going to try to move here. They're going to pay what they can, or they're going to get roommates, they're, they're coming here. And uh, I think the real question in my mind is, how can we accommodate all the people that are moving here with keeping you know, our city uh, not only functional, but also uh, keeping with sort of the historical character that people have grown accustomed to over the years? And I think the answer to that is one, um, our city needs to continue, it, it needs to follow the plans that we've adopted over you know, density uh, is necessary, but it needs to be in certain places, and it shouldn't be placed in areas where um, it's out of control. Um, the second thing, and I, I think this is a, as a, as a, a, a more um, equitable way to accommodate the people moving in, is uh, accessory dwelling units. And I think there needs to be a city program to make it very easy for a homeowner or somebody who owns a house to be able to um, convert part of the house or uh, one of the other buildings on the property to be an accessory dwelling unit. Um, that fits into the, the scale of the neighborhood. And considering all of the single family houses we have all over the city, um, we can accommodate a lot of people by doing that and also generate personal wealth at the same time. Great, so now we'll open it up to follow-up questions. These are one-minute answers. I have one, Michael and David. Um, so I'd like to ask this of, um, ask this of all uh, challengers to incumbents. So you're running against an incumbent. Um, no one has, uh, is entitled to any particular office, but is there a particular reason why uh, Tim Burgess should no longer be on the council? Yeah, I can, I can think of a number of reasons. Um, you know, as a elected Labor leader, and as you know, somebody who's worked in labor unions for a long time, um, I know for a fact that my opponent um, has not always been there for labor. He certainly wasn't there for the cab drivers um, when he voted to um, legalize um, the car share right industry that was operating illegally. Um, I know that during the discussion about the fifteen dollar minimum, minimum fifteen dollar an hour minimum wage. Um, there was an amendment put on the table at council to remove the training wage provision from that, and Burgess uh, voted against that. So those are two examples right there where I feel that he's completely out of step with working people uh, in our city. I know I don't have a lot of time, but I can come up with other things as well. Michael and Dave, uh, you're running for two of uh, one of the two at-large uh, seats on the council. Um, how do you view the role of the at-large member of the council? Mm -hmm. An at-large person, um, and I would hope that 
this would be true for uh, district representatives as well, but you have to have a general understanding and a holistic view of the city um, while really getting into the particularities of each neighborhood. Each community is different, each um, <coughs> each quarter, however you want to divide the city up, um, has their own unique issues. And those unique issues uh, resulted in people passing the uh, district election because they wanted a structure of government that would more easily address that. So, Knowing the general, but also knowing the particularities and being able to work, combine those two. Okay. David? <clears throat> so, um, my question is actually along the same theme as the prior two. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and uh, that is, uh, it, it's interesting to me. First of all, um, are you a union office holder? Yeah, exactly. And what office is that? I'm on the executive board of ILW Local 19, but I'm also on our district council, and both of those are largely our volunteer positions. I, I go to work like anybody else. Well, so thank you. That, that throws it up a lot for me. Now, my question, uh, uh, my real question is, uh, uh, you're in our first neighborhood driven uh, uh, city council election. Mm -hmm. uh, you're running from an RRC, seat, and, and uh, to me, uh, that means that uh, you've got uh, big plans for raising lots of money uh, um, and some sort of a game plan to get your message out citywide, mm -hmm. uh, which is quite a project. And I'm just wondering uh, uh, what that game plan uh, uh, that's going to get you uh, uh, to see. Mm -hmm. Well, obviously, it's a little bit different than um, a more district of game plan would be. Um, I do know that it's going to be impossible to knock on every single door, but we're going to knock on as many doors as we can. Um, you know, there will be a lot of, you know, we'll try to reach households in other ways, like through direct mail, or, you know, social media, or, you know, media coverage, and that sort of thing. Um, you know, I am the underdog, that's definitely true. My fund is very well funded. Um, but I think my message is very compelling in that I offer a solid alternative to him, to as somebody who, understands the city on um, a uh, city-wide basis and also that um, you know I understand neighborhoods I'm you know, active in my neighborhood um, you know I understand transportation I've done a lot of advocacy um, around transportation especially around the south of downtown and uh, I understand the issues of police reform uh, very well as well. Thank you. Yeah. Right, uh, Evan. Can you talk a little bit about your thoughts on the Shell Oil release to Boston Maritime, thereby to the port, and the controversies involved in that issue? Yes. Um, you know, I think the port was very hasty in how that decision came about. We definitely need to be more uh, advanced public notice so that the public and the taxpayers would have, you know, their opportunity to really weigh the cost benefits of, you know, jobs versus, uh, you know, trying to address climate change. Um, you know, having said that, um, you know, the port has entered into a lease agreement, and if the port were to rescind that lease, um, that would open up the port for legal action, which would cost taxpayers millions of dollars. Um, in their <coughs> and also, the damage the port's uh, bonding rating and credibility of attracting uh, jobs and business in, into uh, Seattle. So having said that, what really needs to happen is the city and the port uh, need to enter into a formalized relationship um, an interlocal agreement um, where they can discuss issues of mutual concern, whether it's uh, transportation, whether it's infrastructure, or addressing sustainability and climate change. And that, to me, is uh, the way to move forward and move out of the situation. In the meantime, um, you know, there needs, it needs to be a container terminal. Shell just can't count out there. Thank you. Yeah, we have time for a couple more. Yeah, Renee and then Liz. Well, there definitely needs to be a large uh, public transit component of that because um, I believe West Seattle and Ballard in particular will be very much impacted by you know, a tunnel not being finished and or the viaduct being deemed unsafe and having to come down prematurely. Um, so, you know, a rerouting of 
process, um, you know, a reconfiguration of you know some of the street, you know, the streets downtown. Whether you know we need to change, um, you know, the one-way directions or so forth. You know, temporary throughways. I mean, I know that there's uh, the tunnel staging area that's you know would be possibly available for you know temporary um, throughput. Um, and bottom line is that you know that would only be a, you know a short-term fix. Like this would only happen you know while all these agencies and stakeholders are scrambling to come up with something a little bit more permanent, a little bit more sustainable. So whatever we call it in the short term can't last very long at all. Liz? So you mentioned police reform a number of times as a distinguishing factor in mm -hmm. your candidacy. And I'm wondering, uh, just because there are kind of a number, or what I view as a number of different reforming practices going on right now, mm -hmm. um, which ones you're actually you're referring to specifically, mm -hmm. what it is that you don't like that your opponent is backing, and um, specifically what would you do differently? Mm -hmm. Well, it's unfortunate that my opponent walked away from the Public Safety Committee when uh, you know they needed somebody who ostensibly claims to be a leadership minister. I think that's a real problem. Uh, it's, it's, it's a real, uh, to me, it's a sign that, it's a, it's a sign that maybe that suggests that maybe there's a, a problem that hasn't been addressed, you know, as far as his leadership. Um, having said that, I think that there has to be a very strong community component in all of this. Like, if you try to put together policy reforms only at the top, like, how long must we wait until they trickle down to the bottom? And there's serious issues at the community level, whether we're dealing with communities of color, have issues with how they're treated, you know, in their own neighborhood, on down to uh, neighborhoods like South Park who just don't get these services at all when they call 911. So there's a whole host of issues that happen on the community level. And the community has to be engaged in order for us to know exactly what kind of reforms are needed. So it's not just a reform of technique, it's also a reform of like what people what people's needs and desires are. Um, let's see if anybody else has another question. We'll time for one more. Liz, go ahead with your other follow-up. Can I follow up? Sure. I'm sorry. So I, I spend a, a lot of time being the community representative on law enforcement. I think this is the conversion and in and out with CPC, the community policing uh, is, mm -hmm. is, boy, that board is, is kind of a stellar board of community voices. And I just mm -hmm. am wondering, again, because there are very many reforms at play, mm -hmm. but I am wondering, know the specific reform that, that you're not happy with um, and what you would do specifically differently. Because mm -hmm. they're already underway. It's not going to be decided later. And so I'm just really wondering. Okay. Well, again, um, I feel that there needs to be a strong community component. And it's, you know, when I go out and I talk to people in neighborhoods, what I'm hearing is the police don't talk to us. The city doesn't talk to us. We're not invited to participate. So, you know, I'm not saying that that's not your experience, but the experience I'm hearing from other places is exactly that, and that's especially true on the south end. And, um, you know, I've talked to people on the north end who feel that they're under you know, proper services, and, uh, you know, certainly reforms at the top are taking place. Um, you know, uh, O'Toole has been, you know, making attempts to do things, but I think, you know, ultimately that, you know, in order for these reforms to really say we have to have more community engagement and we have to have more input for more people's uh, actual issues on there. You know, beyond just the, uh, the technique of policing or, you know, technically what the law provides. So we're about out of time. If you want to take 30 seconds for a closing statement. Sure. So, I think one of the things that People might wonder is you know why why would I run against Tim Burgess? You know, Tim Burgess is you know, funded by you know a lot of big money with a lot of big donors. He has over a hundred thousand dollars in the bank. Um, he's you know built a reputation over the years. And my answer to that is that people voted for districts because they wanted to change. They voted a socialist on the city council because they wanted to change. And Tim Burgess has been there for eight years. Um, and I believe that I represent um, that change uh, because I do have a different vision for our city. It's a more progressive vision. And um, I do believe that I'm going to be a lot of support. 
Thank you very much.